Okay, so this section I'll be looking at youth culture um, and taking through the um, one of the, I suppose, as I've discussed, uh, key traditions of, of youth studies uh, research. Um, it's it's interesting sometimes as a kind of researcher of youth culture, or I get asked why why would you do it? Why is it important? Um, people seem to think that the things young people do in their leisure time for creativity, um, to identify with each other, or even just just forms of consumption, aren't important enough to kind of um, to do uh, sociological research for. Um, my response is that they're actually really important. They're the kind of key, I suppose, social spaces where people start to kind of get a sense of self, of who they are, maybe beyond their own kind of immediate family. Um, they're particularly um, places where people um, find others like them um, to hang out with and to be friends with. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the ways that they, they're often very creative and um, resistant to dominant norms, but often kind of, you know, reproduce them as well, sometimes all at once. So I think, um, you know, they're kind of some of the key sociological reasons why they're really interesting places to do um, social research on and with. Um, for young people themselves, you know, much of the research shows that um, youth cultures are kind of satisfying and reassuring places where they can feel relatively safe um, to, you know, play with their identity. Um, it's about kind of becoming someone in many ways, becoming something that isn't just kind of a, a reproduction of you know, your immediate family is um, an immediate kind of um, kin circle. Um, and they're also a way of kind of um, feeling safe in an increasingly precarious world. So that's a kind of a broad philosophical statement, but they're, they're ways of kind of, you know, in a consumer society where there's more and more options, they're a way of kind of limiting those options, um, you know, to avoid the paradox of choice, which, you know, more and more choice often leads to more and more anxiety. Um, they're places to be able to find out things that you can emotionally invest in um, that are beyond the kind of culture industries uh, that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so, you know, much, re much recent literature kind of points out that they're actually a way of managing kind of psychological risks um, and, and can be a refuge from, you know, being bullied or being lonely or being shy or, or having um, to do with various mental health things. On a broad, more broadly sociological level, you know, you maybe could argue that they're a way of escaping, you know, alienation and, or enemy or symbolic violence or these terms that we kind of use in sociology to think about the negative um, psychosocial consequences of capitalism. So I'm particularly interested in youth cultures um, as a way of thinking about, you know, everyday life um, and, you know, the things that people actually want to do and pursue and, and, and um, invest their interest into. One of the things that can be a little bit confusing is the kind of distinction between youth culture and popular culture. So youth cultures are kind of are spaces of consumption where popular culture is consumed, but youth culture and pop culture are different things. So pop culture has loosely been defined as, you know, the culture of the math masses produced by the culture industries, you know, Hollywood movies, you know, big records, you know, and increasingly things like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, but what's interesting about the space of pop culture is that they've been, it's been kind of heavily criticised traditionally on both the left and right of the political spectrum. You know, Marxists criticise it as being worthless and trivial and commercial, and I'll go through some of the Frankfurt School um, critiques of that in a minute. But conservative critics have often um, criticised pop culture as well as being like a threat to the moral fabric of society. And, you know, Elvis shaking his hips on TV in the 50s was banned, you know, because it was too sexual or whatever. So the response to that, those kind of critiques is, you know, maybe um, that isn't a threat to the moral fabric of society. Maybe that's more of an expression of what, you know, society wants. Um, so pop culture here is considered as not just kind of a place of consumption per se, but also as a kind of way that people communicate with each other and um, I suppose associate with each other, but also are exposed to a whole bunch of, you know, informations or politics or whatever that you probably wouldn't get if you, were, you weren't involved in them. So someone like me, you know, growing up in Cessnock in the 80s, you know, bands like Midnight Oil or Public Enemy were really influential on the way that I started to think about the world. They offered me this kind of, you know, leftist or racial politics that I wouldn't have um, probably got exposed to otherwise. So pop culture here becomes a kind of place of debate about things that are going on. 
you know, sure, it's definitely a place where we're sold stuff and we buy stuff and, you know, a key kind of area of profit where capitalism ticks over. But it's more than that as well. So sociologically in, in, in cultural studies, there's some really interesting research about the ways that people relate to pop culture texts. For instance, um, the stuff in the 80s about Dallas and soap operas for interest were, you know, went beyond the idea that they were just for entertainment and you know made us dumb and we just switched off or whatever but then the research showed that you know people were going to work the next day and talking about you know gender and sexuality and these things through these programs so you can see this in a whole bunch of kind of debates today today about you know whether beyonce is a feminist or not whether orange is a new black um is a representation a diverse representation or really maybe it's just you know the story of a white middle class woman and same kind of debates with girls and stuff like that the lena durnham's television show girls so here popular culture becomes a space of kind of negotiation and debate and a way to kind of find out about things that aren't necessarily um you know ref a reflection of yourself now that said as you know borgesian studies show um we tend to um consume things that, that you know we like and that that, that um we're associated with through our gender in our class and our kind of habitus and I'll talk about aspects of that later on as well. So again, you can see here there's a, a tension between um, conformity and creativity and, and that kind of thing. So I spoke a little bit about punk already and I'm, I'm kind of using punk in an example course, so I'll, I'll talk about it through my own research later on in the course. Um, but it's a good example here of thinking about, you know, pop culture, the, the, the kind of crossroads between pop culture and youth culture. Um, so there's a link there to the first five minutes of the Filth and the Fury, a documentary about punk. And what you have there is a kind of now the, you know, almost rote story of the birth of punk, that there was a whole bunch of um, conservative and um, negative eco economic forces happening to people, particularly the working classes in the north of the UK in the, um, the 70s. And the people that were participating in this subculture talk about how punk was kind of the genesis of punk. Um, came out of a kind of um, symbolic and artistic uh, rebellion from what was going on there. So we can study punk in that sense, um, to think about it as a space of rebellion. But, you know, then there's more critically engaged um, stuff with punk about how, you know, how easily you can co-opt co it and the spectacular nature of it can just be sold back in as images and fashion. Um, can, you know, punk be resistive if it's just symbolic. So I'll get into some of these examples throughout the course. But it's a, a good way to think about that is kind of, um, I suppose, starting with that, um, the genesis of punk there, the first five minutes that talks about, has people like Johnny Rotten at the time talking about why they, they got into it. As a way of kind of thinking about subculture theory that I'll talk about in this part of the lecture as well. So much of the studies of youth culture are very heavily influenced by two schools of thinking. There's the, the Marxist kind of Frankfurt School and the Birmingham School, which is often kind of um, seen as the birth of cultural studies. So I'll go through those um, separately now. But you can see in many ways, even though they're very different, there's also have some very um, strong similarities as well. They're both kind of influenced by Marx and uh, neo-Marxian influences. And they both definitely see class as being fundamental to the analysis of pop culture and youth culture but they have really different conceptions of what's happening there. The Frankfurt School largely see youth cultures and pop cultures as being passive, whereas the Birmingham schools see it as kind of something, an opportunity for rebellion and subversion, or if not, just some kind of form of everyday creativity. So one sees pop culture as being nothing but repressive of commercial. The Birmingham School though sees mainstream pop culture as repressive of commercial, but sees these kind of more alternate subcultures formations of pop culture and youth culture as being opportunities for, you know, arti artistic and uh, expression and creativity and, and some forms of rebellion. So to begin with, talk about the Frankfurt School. Now, again, I'm not going to go through all the slides, you know, um, in detail. I'll just use them to guide me through what I want to say here. But um, please read the slides because um, that'll be important for the, for the quizzes um, and to get a, a kind of full understanding of, of what's happening here. Um, the Frankfurt School... Um, I suppose to think about, uh, to be able to kind of understand their perspective, you need to think a little bit about who they were and where they, where, they were, where they were kind of working. So the Frankfurt School was developed, I think, through the 30s, or maybe the 20s and 30s, but this is again at a time when, you know, Nazism was rising in Germany. 
Um, these guys were, you know, you know, radical intellectuals and quite often Jewish. So they had to kind of get out of um, Nazi Germany. They had to flee because they would have ended up in the gulags probably. Um, uh, uh, for instance, Adorno and um, Marcuse made it to America, but ben Benjamin didn't. So his group of refugees were stopped at the Spanish border. And, you know, rather than um, to, to go to jail, Benjamin committed suicide. So this is the kind of real kind of economic, social and cultural circumstances that were affecting these guys' thought at the time. What's interesting, though, is that when the likes of Adorno and Marcuse got to America, um, they saw America as being almost equally as totalitarian as Nazi Germany. Um, but they saw it through a more subtle means. They argue that kind of, I suppose, American culture was so commercial that were people being controlled through those measures rather than the kind of overt threat of uh, physical violence that was happening in Germany. So these theorists tend to see um, culture as being really important in the production of capitalist ideology. Um, where Marx kind of, I suppose, theorised that things will get so bad for the working class in terms of exploitation and alienation that they would rebel, um, mount a revolution and take hold of the means of production. Um, I suppose the Frankfurt School were writing throughout the 20th century of, you know, maybe why that hasn't taken place. And they start position culture itself as being central to the kind of um, distracting the masses, I suppose, is the way that they kind of put it. <clears throat> so Adorno is is particularly important. I'm going to talk a little bit about Adorno, Marcuse, in um, in this in this part. Um, their specific ideas, rather than kind of rendering this part of the broader Frankfurt School. Um, Adorno has particularly been particularly important for thinking about. Um, popular culture and what he coined the culture industry and that's a term now that's used quite widely and it's actually been um, I suppose developed in various ways people now refer to it often as the creative industry even though they're not quite the same thing um, so the culture industry is a term that was kind of developed by Adorno that's become part of the popular lexicon um, and he was particularly concerned with the way that the things like pop music and movies and the advertising industry um, influence the way that people live um, I suppose, uh, make them stupid, make them con consume and distract them from what he would argue were their real needs, which would be, you know, creating a kind of socialist communist society. So for Adorno, participating in mass culture stands under the sign of terror. He really kind of um, fundamentally r relates this to kind of um, a totalitarianism in, in many ways. So I just included here some kind of quotes from a passage from Adorno's um, essay on the culture industry, just to get a little bit of an idea, I suppose, of what he has to say about pop culture, um, which, you know, isn't particularly good. Uh, it intentionally integrates its consumers from above. It forces together the spheres of high and low art. The series of high art is therefore destroyed. Um, what parades as progress in the culture industry remains the disguise for an eternal sameness. You shall conform without instruction as to what. Conformity has placed, uh, replaced consciousness. This consensus propagates, strengthens, blind, opaque authority. So here, the culture industry is pop culture. Not a lot of good stuff going on. There's no room for creativity here um, because as far as Adorno is concerned, everything is always the same. And what he means by this is the culture industry produces what he calls pseudo-individualization. Pseudo-individualization being just the kind of slight differences being um, between the things that are produced by the culture industries. So here, if you think of the kind of average pop song that's on the radio, it's a formula in the sense that it goes, you know, something very close to verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, end. Um, the, um, the plots of movies, you know, regardless of what they are, uh, tend to be the same, you know, following a particular genre. Whether it's a romantic comedy tends to follow a particular thing, an action movie tends to um, follow a particular narrative and so on. Um, this extends to consumer products as well, where, you know, you can walk into a supermarket and see rows and rows and rows of products, but really, you know, how different are they when they're often the same thing, just in different containers and different boxes. So here Adorno argues that the culture industry uh, produces what he calls pseudo-individualization. We can go and choose these different products to make us think that we're being an individual, but really we're just kind of consuming all the same stuff that's just kind of dressed up slightly differently. He has particularly negative things to say about those that listen to pop music um, and argued that he was that there was only two kinds of listener. 
Now, remember here when Adorno was largely writing about pop music, I think mostly in the 40s and 50s here, he's writing about jazz as a kind of form of pop music as opposed to classical music. Um, and now you can see, you know, really jazz would be seen as a higher form of kind of popular cultural music today than, you know, stuff that's on the radio. So these kind of relations to what's seen as high culture and low culture changes over time. And in many ways that can be seen as a, I suppose, a critique of what Adorno has to say. In other ways, you could argue maybe that it um, kind of reinforces it. But as far as, as far as music listeners are concerned, he only saw two kind of two kinds. Those lost in the crowd that are easily led and just kind of basically listened and say what's good as whatever they hear on the radio. And the opposite side of that is the obsessive loner, the kind of person that's like a record collector that needs to buy the, I don't know, the, the Japanese imprint of the Beatles single or whatever. So again, here Adorno is saying that the culture industry has very real effects on the way that people live. It kind of distracts them, it seduces them, but it um, really, in many ways, um, depoliticizes them. Marcuse had some similar things to say about this kind of stuff. He was interested in the way that, like, after the Second World War, that he was um, he saw a kind of increasing what he called end of ideology and manufacturing of consent. Uh, manufacturing consensus, sorry. Manufacturing consent as, as Chomsky. So he was particularly interested in the ways that technology and the media would create what he called false needs. Um, and would manufacture consensus and turn us into kind of a consumer society that again would distract us from our work lives being kind of exploitative and alienating. So he was particularly interested in the way that technology would create wealth and he's talking about the West and particularly America here, that it would create more and more things for us to consume and in many ways kind of separate us from material want and material needs. But rather than the kind of this freedom from necessity being turned into kind of, you know, creativity or more cooperation or, you know, more art artistic kind of um, expression, it would be turned into just consumer culture, where rather than kind of expressing our kind of, you know, real human nature, we'll express this kind of consumer self through the buying of stuff. So he, he argued that, you know, to satisfy people's needs, um, we would not dissent anymore from capitalism, we would just kind of get on with it because we would just consume more and more stuff. And for Marcuse, that would mean we would be passive. So he's aware that he's aware there's a kind of, um, I suppose, paradox here between domination and satisfaction. But he argues that the things that we would kind of then think that we need wouldn't really be needs, they'd actually be wants. And those wants would be superimposed upon us by pretty much the advertising industry he was particularly interested in, in looking at that. So here Marcuse wants to separate between true needs and false needs. Um, the true needs, you know, relate to kind of that Marxist idea of species being where humans want to be creative and cooperative um, and social beings. Um, the false needs here are created by the advertising industry to buy stuff and to kind of create your individuality through those things. So here's a, again a, a kind of extended quote that I've drawn together from Marcuse. Our mass media have little difficulty in selling particular interests. Uh, the political needs of society become individual needs and aspirations. Their satisfaction promotes business. And yet this society is irrational as a whole. Um, most of the prevailing needs to relax, to have fun, to behave and consume in, accord in accordance with the advertisements. To love and to hate what others love and hate belong to the category of false needs. Marcuse was particularly interested in, um, in what this meant for everyday life. He argued basically that as this became more and more normal, that people would actually lose the ability to critically think, that our, critically, our critical thought is stunted in this system for numerous reasons, but mainly he argues we're forced to think less. We're for, forced to think less for ourselves and the culture industries and the advertising industries replace our thoughts with these kind of ideological symbols and texts and, and things like that. So he argues like similar to, uh, to Adorno that there's a package culture that increasingly homogenizes, standardizes, standardizes and sanitizes uh, culture. And this is particularly uh, shaped by the advertising industry. He talked about how this, what this means, will, um, what he calls bastardize our language. And body that, by that he means the way that um, the media and the advertising industry and movies and pop culture and stuff like that actually develop our language in a way that kind of sensationalizes it um, and changes the meanings of things. 
So I think a good way to illustrate this is particularly how um, the media reports on war. Um, and there's a whole bunch of euphemisms developed after the Gulf War in the 90s in particular about collateral damage and friendly fire. Collateral damage being that if, you know, a bomb goes off to, you know, kill an en enemy, if, you know, 15 civilians were killed, there'll be collateral damage. So that term becomes a way to kind of bracket out the actual destruction and, you know, horrible things that happen there. You can think about this in the, kind of the fashion industry as well, you know. Um, if, say, a famous actress's dress is just, you know, when she's walking up the red carpet at the Oscars, is to, you know, um, is described as an atrocity, uh, fashion atrocity. How did we then kind of have the language to kind of keep talking about actual atrocities, you know, things like genocide and, and stuff like that. So Marcuse was really concerned with the way that the culture industries and the advertising industries kind of change the way that we use language. Uh, Benjamin is another uh, really important um, um, theorist uh, about um, uh, from the Frankfurt School. He's particularly interested in thinking about the, um, the works of art. So, you know, he argues that as um, things like photography and films and television, he was writing kind of pre-television, but like we can think about how this would work today and the internet again. As um, these things become the way that we consume stuff through photos and through TV, in that sense, they're mediated. Um, Mark, uh, Benjamin argued that this would, you know, change what art is and art and what art's for. So rather than the kind of the key way of experiencing an artwork would be going to the um, gallery and experiencing the aura of it in person, we increasingly experience art through those mediums, which for Benjamin means the aura of art is lost. And further than that, it means that art starts to become produced just to be reproduced through those mediums. And this we kind of, for Benjamin, fundamentally kind of challenges the, the political or resistive nature of art. And art itself becomes something that's just kind of sold, um, like, you know, a song or a, or a record or a film. That the kind of um, humanistic creative expressions of art and the kind of maybe artworks as being politically uh, resistive to dominant norms will be lost. Um, so in particular, you can think here, I think about um, uh, the work of, say, Damien Hirst, who, you know, basically produces artworks now that, you know, literally cost millions of dollars to make because they're often made out of gold and then they're sold for a hundred million dollars to some CEO to put up in their, in their office or whatever. And I suppose that's an extreme example, um, but this is kind of how um, Benjamin argued that, that would play out. And it's interesting, you know, I used to be quite suspicious about this argument. Um, but then, you know, a few years ago, I was in a gallery in Glasgow and there was this um, uh, a huge painting by Salvador Dali that I'd only seen through photos before. And when I was in front of it, it was actually, yeah, it made me kind of gasp and the way it was lit was um, really impressive. And it actually made me kind of have all these feelings that I certainly hadn't had before by looking at it through photos in a book or online. So again, this is um, an important way of thinking because it thinks about the way that kind of popular culture becomes about the reproduction of things and the reproduction of the same things over and over again and how those things become, you know, saleable objects rather than, you know, emotional experiences. So you can imagine um, there's a lot of critique of this stuff. The Frankfurt School's work is, you know, pretty much fundamental to think about um, popular culture, but it's overtly critical and really all of the work since the Frankfurt School in some way is talking back to it. Um, that's how important it is. So even work that criticises it, um, you know, tends to consider those aspects that the uh, Frankfurt School theorists point out, um, even if it's to kind of argue against it. So some argue it's elitist, that, you know, it promotes high culture over pop culture, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of class problems with doing that that I'll talk about when we look at Bourdieu, that it's just overtly negative, that there's not a lot of empirical evidence for this. There's like, you know, how do you get to define what's false and true needs? If there is false consciousness being developed by this, how do you know... How do you exist outside of the false consciousness to be able to develop this thought? If we did live in kind of Marxist utopia, would you know, how would music actually exist? How would it actually be disseminated and who would produce it and all that kind of thing? So there's a lot of kind of criticism of this, but really, you know, it's interesting when I do tutorials, you know, on this kind of material, it seems that a lot of people agree with the Frankfurt School's points of view about other people's taste, but not so much their own taste. So you need to remember here that, you know, the Frankfurt School won't distinguish between, say, a, you know, a band like, say, I don't know, Rage Against the Machine that actually have Marxist lyrics against something like, 
uh, you know, I don't know, a kind of pop band. Um, as far as the Frankfurt School is concerned, there's no difference between those two things. In fact, maybe the kind of overtly political band is worse because it makes people think that they're doing politics when they're actually just consuming. So within pop culture, there's no re no kind of realm for distinction here going on and kind of making value judgments over whether you know some bands are more revolutionary or artistic over others. The Frankfurt School aren't really concerned with that. They kind of you know render it all the same as being part of that kind of ideological machine. And so what I've found over the years is that, you know, people often already have a Frankfurt School point of view about pop culture and mass culture and, I don't know, reality television or, or whatever. Um, but then when it comes to their own tastes, kind of get offended if you kind of use that logic back against them. Um, so um, that's something to consider, I suppose, about the way that you think about um, other people's tastes. And we'll kind of look at some um, other theoretical ways of thinking about those things throughout the course. So the second really important school of thinking about youth culture um, and kind of where the very idea of youth culture was developed is the Birmingham School. Again, they have a much more positive attitude towards pop culture and youth culture, but again, they, they in a way, they're just more discerning about it. They, again, kind of point to the mainstream as being, you know, largely ideo ideological like the Frankfurt School, but then what the Birmingham School did was point to these other kind of more alternative um, subcultural um, forms of um, creativity and consumption and music in particular <clears throat> to point out that maybe not all pop culture and youth culture is an expression of the dominant forms of politics. Pardon me. So they have a more um, popular, more positive attitude to pop culture, but it's not completely positive. And they tend to point to specific groups that are doing pop culture or youth culture in the right way. So there's, or at least in a resistive or a spectacular way. Um, so there's been a whole bunch of, you know, heaps of stuff over the years. And this punk is particularly important, and goths and mods and rockers. Uh, throughout the 90s, riot girls and raves, and then, you know, in the early 2000s, culture jamming. Um, throughout the 80s and 90s, there were some really interesting kind of subcultural studies about football hooliganism in, and the violence that happens around football games in, in the UK. You know, all this kind of stuff has produced some really interesting ways of thinking about um, these activities. <clears throat> so the Birmingham School was developed in the late 60s around the work of Stuart Hall, who was the original kind of um, convener of, of that school, and some really prominent um, cultural studies and um, social uh, sociologists um, came out of that place, from Dick Heveridge, Paul Willis, Angela McRobbie, um, you know, many others. They argue against the idea that it's pop culture is just nothing but dominant ideology, and they point to people that they argue taking part in what they call positive mass consumption and tended to associate this with the expression of, um, say, young people's interests or working class interests or, or women's interests. And pointing out that there's some activities going on in youth culture that actually works against dominant hegemony, that tries to make you know, spaces for the working class to be able to um, uh, create and um, represent themselves or for women to be able to have some kind of um, a voice in largely do male dominated spaces. So they start talking about culture in a kind of more anthropological way than the, the Frankfurt School. Uh, le much less elitist and an important distinction to make here between the Frankfurt School and the Birmingham School is the members of the Birmingham School actually did social research. The Frankfurt School were philosophers, the Birmingham School were um, quite often ethnographers or they were participant obs um, observers in the subcultures that they were interested in. In this sense they were insiders, um, you know, often people doing research on punk were punks themselves. Now this can have some problem in terms of bias and kind of I suppose doing research that promotes a particular point of view, but what it also does is it allows some kind of really deep um, emotional understandings of what's happening in those spaces. So these ethnograph ethnographic kind of studies started to draw out a kind of wide range of kind of values and meanings that are kind of developed in these spaces that move beyond kind of, you know, dominant ideologies, I suppose. So in this sense, there's not just one culture that actually, you know, we live in a world that people are doing all kinds of different stuff um, and that, you know, different cultural activities are shaped by class, race, ethnicity, gender, age, um, geography, uh, religion, all these things mean that people participate in culture in very different ways, to the point where you would argue that there's just not one culture in a particular country or whatever. 
Uh, they draw on semiotics and, and a hegemonic analysis that you should have looked at throughout um, other sociology courses already. Um, in this sense, the pop culture and youth cultures are a side of struggle. They're a side of struggle between um, subordinate groups and the dominant norms of society. And these struggles, you know, in terms of relation to moral panics and generations, are often generational struggles um, where, you know, punks come along to kind of, you know, uh, say that things like Pink Floyd and stuff like that were just bloated and horrible and, you know, we need this kind of more um, everyday way of doing music that anyone could do, that you shouldn't have to be an expert and, you know, have 10 years of guitar lessons or whatever to be able to play play in a band. So you can see here, again, then these are kind of struggles over how, the way things should be, the way things are, and the way they should be in the future. So semiotics is the study of signs. So here, the idea of semiotics analysis of these youth cultures point out that much of the creativity that's going on here, and, and particularly any of the resistance to dominant norms that's going on, is often symbolic. It's done through fashion, it's done through music, it's done through rituals um, that um, create a lifestyle, a way of living, a way of presenting oneself that isn't just kind of the dominant norm or a stereotype or something like that. So the very obvious example here is the punk mohawk, developed as a way for those people to kind of very um, obviously symbolise that they don't want to be considered normal, um, in inverted commas in that sense. The mohawk in that sense isn't just a kind of fashion statement, it's a political statement. Now again, a good example with the mohawk is a way that something like a fashion statement can be co-opted, um, and increasingly over time it just becomes you know less and less rebellious and more and more normal. Um, and you know, you, you, the version of it in the kind of late 90s, early 2000s, where David Beckham had this kind of, you know, mohawk shaped hair that wasn't really a mohawk, um, is a good way of kind of showing the trajectory of how symbols change over time. They become co opted. Hegemony um, is a way of thinking about how um, pop culture and youth culture is a site of struggle. So there's people that dominate cultures, but there's actually people that resist them as well. And hegemony is the idea that there needs the dominant kind of people in society need to actually allow some resistance stuff every now and then. Otherwise, there might be a revolution as people, uh, you know, feel heaps alienated or exploited or whatever. So in this sense, hegemony is a moving equilibrium. Things change slowly over time in this kind of constant balance between coercion and consent. Um, consent here being people that in or parts of your life where you do follow the dominant norms and um, sorry coercion being that and consent being a kind of place for individuals to kind of have a relative autonomy from those kind of dominant forces so in this sense pop culture itself is seen as a side of struggle where the dominated re are rebelling against the dominant and Stuart Hall in particular talks about this through um, the notion of encoded and decoded semiotics where uh, people can use everyday symbols um, to try and create their own kind of senses of meaning. Um, and uh, Michelle de Certeau's work of the practice of everyday life is really important in that sense as well. This resistance is symbolic and through rituals. It's not necessarily changing a system as a whole, but kind of creating spaces in, in your life to be able to live within the system, but you know, have some autonomy, have some freedom, have some self-expression that isn't just kind of ideological, where you're just not a consumer or you're just not a worker. So this has been important to help us to think about how pop culture itself is a place of practice and creativity. It's not just about kind of consuming mindly, mindlessly. And I suppose the debates in sociology are over kind of, you know, where you stand on how much, you know, pop culture is a side of practice and creativity and, or, you know, conformity and, and consumption. One of the individual methods of this kind of creativity that the subcultural theorists and, um, and the Birmingham theorists were particularly interested in is through this idea of bricolage. And it's kind of taking everyday um, things and turning them into something else. So again here, um, you know, punks use paper clips as earrings or use garbage bags as um, clothing and, you know, and they're symbolising to say that society treats me like garbage, so I'll wear a garbage bag to express that, to ironically kind of play with those things. So bricolage here is a way of tinkering with everyday products, everyday things, borrowing, combining, recombining, altering, embellishing, these kind of things to create something new. Um, Paul Willis's work in particular um, about um, the, the cultural aspects of that has been particularly um, important. 
So you can see this happening day to day life, things like culture jamming where people, you know, um, graffitied billboards to change the meaning of them. You know, if you see someone in skateboarding in a car park in, in that's in effect, a act of bricolage. That is, they're using a space largely constructed for production, i.e. people to park while they're working or consumption, i.e. people to park while they're shopping and using it in a kind of and reinventing it in a new way that's kind of goes against the grain. Um, and you can see all kinds of different versions of this. There's a whole kind of, for instance, um, being a subculture of using Barbie and Ken dolls to make porn videos to kind of, I suppose, critically engage with the problematic aspects of those dolls in terms of gender and sexuality and body image. So these things kind of link the local and the global um, through this notion of bricolage. After the kind of initial subcultural theorists, you know, foundational works throughout the the late 60s, early 70s and early 80s, oh, sorry, 70s and early 80s. Um, the, the work on kind of youth culture, I suppose, broadened out and started to think about things that weren't just particular subcultures and started to embrace the mainstream a little bit more as well and actually started to critically engage with that dichotomy between, you know, there's just a, you know, a mass of you know young people mindlessly consuming over here and there's a kind of small group of young people you know doing political forms of consumption creativity here that kind of distinction started to be problemized um and you know th um, analysis became a little bit more general and there's been a whole um interesting kind of theorization around that that i'll talk about towards the end of the lecture a really good study of this is kind of stephen miles's colleague and colleagues work about fitting in and sticking out that relates to those ideas of kind of creativity and conformity about kind of fitting in but also being kind of you know your own individual self as well and they did they did these studies in high schools I think in um, Britain where um, you know you had to wear a uniform so people were kind of forced to conform in various ways but then they would do little things with them like I don't know wear a badge or roll their sleeves up or something to kind of preserve their own kind of sense of individuality so this you know you can start thinking about those kind of small things that people do to create resistance as, is that actually individuality or is it kind of pseudo individuality that the kind of Frankfurt School talk about. So people kind of want to fit in and stick out. Um, and there's been a whole bunch of other criticisms of the Birmingham School. I won't go into all them, but like even Angela McRobbie, who was like a Birmingham um, cultural theorist herself back in the seventies, you know, was pointing out straight away that like a lot of the subcultures were kind of giving um, women a subordinate role and ignoring the domestic sphere and concentrating on only the spectacular things that happen in the public in the in the public sphere um, critique of subcultural kind of as a as a term that it became a kind of catch-all for everything and um, you know it ends up becoming a little bit meaningless that there was an over kind of um, emphasis on the political or resistant aspects when you know maybe a lot of people that just participating for fun that the working class aspects were being over over romanticized particularly you know in punk when you know people like joe strummer and Susie sue out of the banshees were actually at you know middle class art school um maybe that resistance needs to be more than symbolic and you know all these other kind of changes all these other criticisms sorry i think one of the key criticisms of the subcultures is you know if it if it's popular it must be bad um which is like the frankfurt school position just move to the birmingham school position if it's popular it must be bad you know unless it's popular with the right people and done by these people in particular so something like the frankfurt school work as i said has got many many criticisms and so has the birmingham school there's been a whole industry over the past 20 years developed about critically engaging with the birmingham school's work and again like the frankfurt school though it's fundamentally kind of it's a it's part of the canon to think about youth culture and it's you know been fundamental to the ways that we've kind of i suppose started thinking about youth cultures and pop, pop cultures as, a, as an important thing to be thinking about in terms of research and because it's so important to people's day-to-day -day lives. So in those previous couple of decades there's a bunch of new ways to kind of think about youth cultures that isn't just you know termed under subculture. There's a work about post subcultures, work about club cultures, particularly the rise of um, kind of the rave scenes in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, Sarah Thornton started to write about taste cultures in terms of like lifestyles, neo-tribes, scenes. Scenes is the one that I think is particularly useful and Will Straw's work on that has been quite influential on my own work that we'll look at later on. And then you know, obviously as the rise of the internet there's cyber cultures and all these different things. So um, 
within in the course guide there's um, there's some papers I think on most of those basically each of the way that these new kind of concepts are developed illuminates a different aspect of what's going on um, you know around those things of consumerism performance globalization creative creativity you know the way technology comes along and you know changes these things and we start thinking about the digital realm and that kind of thing okay so to quickly conclude uh, moral panics have been really important in terms of thinking about how the media misrepresents things and um, in many ways serves particular interests, distorts, sensationalise, and this has, you know, huge effects on public understandings and the creation of policy that, you know, then ironically often, often seems to create more moral panics. The concept of generation has been important to think about differences between, you know, people of different ages and the way that we relate to, you know, different events or different popular cultural texts differently. Um, as we you know get older or if we weren't around when those things were invented or happening but it's important not to kind of overgeneralize the sameness of people of the same age youth culture has become a really key site of social research um, it really does become a kind of really interesting site for a whole bunch of sociological phenomena um, but you know for youth studies practitioners in, in, in particular it's a really important kind of area of study to think about how young people are kind of you know trying to construct their own identities and become someone, you know, away from the institutional things of school or workplace or the influence of their family. Okay, thanks.